All right, so we are going to get started. Um, so this is Lifeline Partnership, and I'm Jennifer. I'm acting as the executive director because um, Pastor Suzanne has left us, and we're very sad, but we are... Yeah. But we're excited to kind of look to the future. So today we're going to be talking about the Underground Railroad and then also other acts of civil disobedience. Um, so we're going to start today by just giving you a history of the Underground Railroad, um, people who were active, some of the people who were active in getting enslaved people out of the South to the North and to freedom, as well as some people who, enslaved people who went from um, the South and escaped on the Underground Railroad. So first of all, I'm gonna have, so Greg is gonna share his screen with us so he can, so he can, he's my slide man today. So I'll go through and we'll be able to see some pictures of some people. Okay, so the Underground Railroad. Again, if anyone has questions, just pipe in while we're talking. We'll talk, we'll we ask some different questions about things as we go to. Okay, so the first one, first we're gonna talk about is a guy named Isaac Hopper. So we'll let Greg get to the, oh, well, first we'll talk about the kind of how it worked, all right? So as you can see, you see all the red lines on here. So these were basically routes that people could take out of the south into the north and to freedom. And some people actually would go to the, would go further south. So t Mexico was not a slave country, and so people from t enslaved people from Texas would escape into Mexico. Um, and people then would also leave Florida via water to also escape. So the gray states are the slave states, the green states are the free states, and then the yellow were territories. So they hadn't, a lot of them hadn't made a decision yet, and that's why you had some conflicts out there. And so there were code words that people used um, yeah, so there were code words that people used rather than, so they would talk about it as a railroad, though they often didn't use the railroad, sometimes they did, but they were using the term as code so that people didn't necessarily know what they were talking Hi. about. Hi there, how you doing? Is that you, Charlene? Or Allison? Allison. Hi, Allison, it's good to have you on the call. Um, so the tracks, so, the, tra so the, the tracks were the routes that they took. Um, the stations were hiding places. The conductors were people who took people from on the, like Harriet Tubman, right, who took people, who guided them from one location to another. Um, the railroad agents were people who sympathized and they connected enslaved people to other people who could help them get out of slavery. The station masters or uh, people, yeah? Jennifer, I got it. Did you get your thing? Okay. Well, my name, oh, Jennifer. Yep. Jennifer. What? I didn't see the um the um the woman. Can you see the map? I didn't. I see my big car. My woman, big car. I didn't see my man. I didn't get it. My big car. I know. I sent it. To, I sent. I sent electronic copy to Anne, so she'll give that to you. Okay. I'll I'll talk about I'll talk about with you later, but I took care of it already. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. So then there uh, were there were this, um, there were passengers and so they were the escaped enslaved people. Um, tickets indicated people who are traveling, right? So they're actively moving along through the rail, underground railroad. Uh, the knee, uh, I mean, I mean, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, honey, I can't and, didn't understand you. And, oh, did I need it myself? Where Okay, so the stockholders were people who provided financial support, the freedom trails were the routes, and then the terminal or heaven or promised land is where people would be free, so like Canada or the northern free states. So um, first we'll talk about Isaac Hopper, and he is called the father of the Underground Railroad. So he was a very early person who set up, um, who, who worked on a, kind of like a cell to get people. Excuse yes. me. Yeah? Are we going to what? Are we going to what? The marker, you said. I'm sorry. The marker. Oh, those. About the, the oh, the, oh, your, your, the, the quilting things. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes, I also want to talk about that too, Jennifer. Okay, we'll talk about that. Let's let's get through this, and then we'll then then let's talk. About, well, you want to talk about that now? So, did you guys get your kits? No, I didn't get my prize. What what? No, so what's your name? My name is Vanessa Monroe. So it didn't, oh, I, it didn't arrive? Mine didn't arrive either. Mine didn't arrive either. 
Oh, that's because I because I had a couple that came back, but I sent them yesterday. But that was for Letitia was and for Freddie. Okay. okay, Vanessa, I'll see if I can send you one when I get back, okay? All right. Okay, because I have some extras. Okay. Excuse me. Yes, and, yes, Allison. As Ann, Chuck Adams, on the same thing, as the day she said, could Ann see it? Could Ann see it? Okay. I'll see what I can do. Okay? Okay, thank you. So, Allison and Vanessa both. Okay, thank you. Okay. One more, right? Well, right? Allison, I already took care of that. That's that's all done. You ha the card okay, I sent. Thank her, you. Okay, we're you're good. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay, so this, well, let's talk about what this gentleman, so this is Isaac Hopper. Can we get back to the, uh, He was a Quaker. Does anyone know what a Quaker is? No, I don't know what a Quaker. Quaker, so a Quaker is a, is a, Quaker is a religion, okay? It's a Christian religion. Oh, he's a slave? No, he wasn't. He was actually, Quakers are very, were very opposed to slavery. They were very early opposed to slavery before even the United States became a country. They protested against it. Um, and um, so even today, Jennifer. people who are Quakers, they um, they usually advocate for prison reform and other social justice issues. Jennifer. Yes. A question. Uh, do we keep these or we got to give it to y'all? Do you keep what? This script. These ain't like to be saying we found it. Oh, yeah, she just all sent it to y'all. She's showing you, she's showing the quilting hoop. Oh, you got it. Okay, and great. Out. Okay, so. Th I said, do women want to do it? Do you want to send it to y'all? Back to y'all? Do you need to, does she need to send the quilt? No, that you get to keep it. It's for you to, you. it's for you to keep. Well, that's what they told me, this right here. Yeah, okay. we, I, we're, you home, get, so yeah, you get to get keep it. House. Yeah, you get to keep it. Can we get back to the, to the Quaker? Yeah, let's get back to the Quaker. Thank you, Vanessa. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I'm so sorry. Okay, so so Quakers again, they, they, and then to this day, right? They're they're very um, they're very into social justice issues. So this gentleman, he would hi he would hide people in his home, and mm -hmm. he would he had a whole network of spies that would look out for people who were called slave hunters who were trying to re return escaped mm -hmm. enslaved people back to the South. So he and this, the, so he was he was very he was the first person to really that we know of who really set up a system like this. So the next Jennifer, person we'll talk about is Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman, this is she's a slave, right? Yeah, so she was a slave, right? So she was, um, she and escapes, the, right? She escaped slavery herself. Born. She was born out in Maryland, right on the eastern shore here, right? So she was very local, Mama, and she walked. Yep. Yep. So she walked a hundred. Yeah, she walked a hundred miles from where she was enslaved to Pennsylvania to freedom, and then she would go back. Oh. Right? Can you consider how dangerous that was? She would go back to the mm, Eastern yeah, Shore. Yeah, she went back at least thirteen times, and she brought at least oh. seventy enslaved people out to freedom. And then, if that wasn't enough, during the Civil War, she acted as a scout for the Union Army, and she was a spy and a nurse. So she's a very talented woman and very, very brave. Right? And so she says, why do you think they called her Moses? Moses? Right? Do you know who Moses was? Um, she's a slave. So Moses was... A, uh, Moses was a guy who took the slaves out of I mean, Egypt in biblical times, right? He parted the waters of the Red Sea and led the slaves out of Egypt. So she was seeing as that she was the Moses of her people. You know, let my people go. So that was like Harriet Tubman. Hey, Jennifer. Yes, honey. Look like, like she's saying. Well, you know, when people took pictures at that time, they didn't smile, did they? Nope. It was very early for early photographer and because it, it took a long time for the photograph to set. And so if you were smiling, you might get, it might be movement. Yep. Yeah. But, but, but that's why. So I think it's mainly because they just, people weren't smiling then on, in their photographs. So now we're going to talk about Thomas Garrett. 
Tubman's so he was. He's the, he was a friend of Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman would often go through his home with the enslaved people she brought out of Maryland. And he is another Quaker, right? So another person with that same religion. Um, and he claimed that he aided at around 2,750 fugitive slaves before the Civil War broke out. And he provided a place to stay. He would give them money and clothes, food. And sometimes he would personally walk them from one location to another, to another safe spot. Say it again. Yep. Yep. Right on his arm. Okay, then we're going to talk about William Still. All right, so William Still, he was a railroad agent, right? So he, he kept people in his house, and he also provided a lot of money for this. So he was born, uh, he was he was a freeborn African American, and he chaired a committee which gave out food and clothing in Pennsylvania, and he coordinated escapes. I like, I like your house in the room. I know. No, thank you. <laughs> he he raised money yeah, and he man. served. So he basically had like a one shop, one stop shop for people coming out of Ooh. out of this out of slavery. He would provide all this stuff and then gun. send them on to to uh, to a new life. What a guy. Yep. And so the next person we'll talk about is Lee Coffin, and he again we have another Quaker, right? So we're seeing a pattern here of Quakers, people, religious people who are really opposed to slavery. And he was called the president of the Underground Railroad. And he became opposed to slavery when he was seven years old, when he saw a column of chained enslaved people being driven for, to an auction. He was so angered by that, he just, he was appalled. Um, so he started, again, very young. He'd bring food. His family would also hide slaves on their property, and he would bring food to them. And then he became very successful merchant and he became a station master so he'd help people along the way when he lived in indiana and then cincinnati and he said he insisted of he assisted about 3300 enslaved people he and his wife would often get knocks on the door at night and they'd bring people in and they'd help them and then send them on their way to a better location um yeah, do I cut these down? yep I mean, just, uh, do. yep I mean, it's right. okay so the next one is elijah anderson no, I don't. So we have another African American. So he lived in the free state of Indiana and he was across the Ohio River from Kentucky, which was a slave state. So he and several other members of the town's black middle class, they set up their own underground railroad, their own part of the underground railroad. So he was light skinned enough that he could pass for a white slave owner. So what he would do, he would go down into Kentucky pretending to be a white man. He would then round up about 20 to 30 enslaved people and then he would take them to freedom to his own home. Which that's very brave when you think about what he's doing. Because did we, did any of you see like 12, 12 years a slave, right? So that was a man who was born a black man who was born a free man, and then he was caught and enslaved in the South. So he he was putting his life on the line every time he did this. Okay. So if if you is there would any of you felt comfortable being a conductor going down into the South and bringing people out of slavery? How would you would you like to do that, Allison? Would that have been scary? Can I say something? Yeah. Vanessa, would you would you want to be a conductor? Like 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 Chris and his party there. They're gonna they're gonna go to the south. Yep. They're going to the south. Chris and his party. Would you say Jennifer? Vanessa, would you want to be a, Vanessa? Would you want to be a conductor? Would you want to help people get out of slavery? Would that be hard? Would you be scared? I'd be scared. No, I, I could do it. You could do it? I'm glad you're a very brave woman. I am proud of you. <laughs> so now let's talk about some of the people who um, escaped from the South. So this is Henry Bibb. And I love this picture. Doesn't he look very um, dashing, I think? Um, so he, in, he escaped from Kentucky to Detroit at the age of 27. Um, he also then helped others to escape later on. He was an author and a lecturer, and he wrote his he wrote the narrative and life of the life and adventures of Henry Bibb, an American slave. So he wrote a, he wrote an autobiography that was very very popular at the time. Um, he eventually so in 1850 the um, Congress passed this thing called the Fugitive Slave Act. So anyone who was harboring a slave in the North had to return what they saw as property to the South. So it became much more, the people couldn't just stay, go to the free states because they could then yeah. have to be returned Ooh, south. So they had to go into Canada or even further. So he eventually, Canada. in 1850, he went to Canada and he opened the first black owned newspaper in that country. So he's a very talented man. 
Okay, the next person, the next person is Henry Box Brown. So Henry was very clever guy. He was a Virginia slave who escaped to freedom at the age of 33 by arranging to have himself mailed in a wooden crate in 1849 to abolitionists in the North. So he, he put himself in a box and then he put him and then he mailed himself to some folks who were expecting him in the North. So this is a picture of him at the bottom kind of being out of the box. I doubt he was that comfortable though. Would you want to be in a box going on a train or on a, on a, you know, on a wagon? You know, how do you eat? Um, Where do you go to the bathroom? Because this would have to take no. several days, right? That would be, no. he's very brave to do that. It must have been very uncomfortable and scary. Because, you know, you always see the boxes that says this end up. How often does that end really stay up, right? They turn it up and down. They drop the box. So anyway, he was very brave. So after, after so it, he migrated then to England in 1850 to escape the fugitive Slave Act, and there he was a lecturer. He was also a magician and um, a mesmerist. Do you know what a mesmerist is? It's a hypnotist. So he, again, a very talented man, and he eventually came back to the United States like after the Civil War. So then we have um, Addison White. So Addison White ran away from Kentucky, um, and then he ended up in Mechanicsburg, Ohio. And there, the city, his, his former owner, which I don't like the word owner, owner I don't know what else we'd call him, because we don't, you, I don't think you can own people. Um, his owner sued to have him returned. Um, and so the people in Mechan the citizens in Mechanicsburg raised $950 so that they could buy his freedom. The people in Mechanicsburg were, were, were very possessive of his freedom. They were, they were very nervous for him. And there was actually acts of violence that broke out as they tried to protect him from the slave hunters that came to get him back. So there's a very sense of community there. The next person is um, Anna Marie Weems. And you see how she's dressed as a boy, right? So she was 15 when she escaped um, with the help of William Still, who we talked about earlier, right? One of the... Um, one of the conductors. So she left her home in Rockville, Maryland, and then she went through, so again, very, very local, right? She went through Philadelphia, Washington, DC, then Brooklyn, New York, and then she finally arrived in Ohio. It took her two months to get there, and six weeks of that, she was just in like complete hiding because they were looking for her. Um, so she was disguised as Mr. Joe Wright, a male carriage driver. So you see she has a driver's uniform, a cap, and a bow tie. So several, many, some women did this. They dressed as, um, they dressed up as men. And there was one married couple who the wife dressed up as a, as a man. And then, her, and she was very light skinned. So she passed as white. And she then had her husband as her, as, as her slave is what she, you know, her assistant. And they took the train and took the train north. And that's how they escaped. All right, so the last person we'll talk about here is Lewis Hayden. So Lewis was, again, a very, very talented man. He, um, in Kentucky, he acquired a carriage and he traveled. Um, he had friends who helped travel with their escape. They covered their faces with flour, so they appeared to be white. And so it was him and his wife and their son. And then they traveled from Lexington, Kentucky to Ripley, Ohio. Um, and so th actually the people who helped him, uh, there was a man and a woman, and they were both, um, they were both put in prison for helping him for quite a while. And then he then set up a school for African Americans in Canada, and he eventually resettled in Boston. And then he was a very active lecturer. He was a politician. He was elected to the state, the Congress in the state of Boston. And he was also a businessman. OK. So those are some of our people. I think they're very interesting. You know, and these are just a few people. There are so many other people with all their stories that you can, that you can read about. So if you were going to leave your home, so let's look at, um, so all these folks who left, right? They, first of all, a lot of slaves, enslaved people didn't own much, right? But if you had to leave and you had to carry everything you had on your back at that time and you were an enslaved person, what would you take with you? So here are some examples of things. So, so like Allison or Ryan or Vanessa or Harold, what would you take if you had to leave? This is it, you're not going back. You're gonna to have to provide for your future and things that are important to you. So what would be important for you to take with you? What would you take? Um, you had to carry yep. a 
pan. A pan, yep. You might take some things to cook with, right? Because you know where you're going to be. And if you're cold, uh, you, if you're, corn, yep, you take some corn, take some food with you, right? A candle, Bible. Yep. Right. Bread. Bread. Yep. So you want to make sure you have food, right? And like an axe. Shoes and clothes. Yep. Mm. Uh, so let's talk about today. And That's very and, uh, good. And, um, and, and take that like, the that light. Uh, yeah, like a, a lantern, whatever. right? A lantern. In a, in a, in a child. Okay, so, in a, in a, so uh, maybe a doll. And a, and a dust, and so, a so. So let's talk about today now, okay? So let's. So now people talk about having go bags, right? So that you know, if if you have to leave your house very quickly, what would you take? And you only have a backpack. So are there things that you have now in your house that you would have to take with you, but you have to be able to carry it, right? So what would those things be? Do you have anything special that you would want to make sure you te- took with you wherever you went? But just what you would have, right? You might want money, but money. Yeah. But do, do any of you have anything special? Like, like I have something that my dad made, right? I have, I have something my dad made that I want to take with me, right? Because my dad died and I want to have a piece of him wherever oh, I went, right? Do you have any pictures that you'd want to take with you? Pictures of your family that you would want to make sure you didn't lose? Money. Money. Money ID. <laughs> uh, yep. A funny pet. A funny pet. A fanny pack, yeah. And a book bag. But so, so, but are there things that you guys have that are special to you that you wouldn't want to lose? Um, keychain. Keychain? Mm-hmm. And money. Mm-hmm. And a teddy bear. Yeah, do you guys, do any of you have any stuffed animals that you'd want to take with you if you went somewhere? Yeah. Yeah. See, I'd, tra- I'd want to take my cats, but I don't think I could put them in a backpack. They wouldn't like that. Yeah, I won't need a, yeah. a big old monkey. There'd be a lot of there'd be a lot of yelling then. Yeah. Okay. All right, that's good. All right, so let's now we're gonna talk about civil disobedience. So okay. let's um let's go through some of these examples and then we're gonna have Donna and, and Susie talk. So um okay. so civil disobedience so is when you use a peaceful method to protest something that you see, uh, laws that are unfair or injustice, right? So here there are women who are protesting suffrage and suffrage means the right to vote. So women in the United States didn't have the right to vote in national elections until 1920. Um, And so these women were, and the reason for that is they thought women weren't smart enough and it was unfeminine to vote, right? So these, these women, can you tell they're outside the White House and they're protesting? So then, then another another big famous protest is the Montgomery bus boycott, which you guys probably have heard of with Rosa. We all know who Rosa Parks is. Oh yeah, but she had the back of the bus. Right, exactly. She wouldn't. She was at the back of the bus, in you know. Then the the bus was segregated with blacks in the back and whites in the front, and and then on this particular bus, if 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 whites could go in and push blacks out of their seats if there weren't any seats left in the white part of the section. And so Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white man. And so then she was arrested. You see, she's being fingerprinted there. And so this then, of course, led to it was everyone was outraged and led to a boycott of the bus system. So for nearly a year, the buses were virtually empty. So what people did, right, people didn't have cars, they walked. Some people would walk eight miles a day to get to and from work for months and months and months because they were not going to take the bus until the buses were desegregated. And so that's this middle picture here, right? Of everyone walking to and from work. Um, And so what people did then is they set up carpools, right? So people could get from places, so kind of like a, you know, the old fashioned Uber, right? That they would set up carpools for people to do that. And then again, local churches would donate some station wagons as taxis that would pick people up. Um, and then this was finally ended when the courts found that segregated bus system was unconstitutional. And this is because of the well, Brown versus the Board of Education. Does everyone heard about that? That's when it was found that separate, se- they, they were saying before that separate is, is that, you, that you, it's okay if they were separate, just so long they were equal. Well, that was found to be um, right in education. And so this was the very beginning of the civil rights movement and established Martin Luther King Jr. as a leader. Oh, he died. Yeah. 
But so, but, but part of this, right, a lot of this, this again is coming out of the churches, like our Quakers, right? A lot of these act actions were built from the black churches. So then we also had the um, lunch counter sit-ins that happened in the 60s. So in February 1st, 1960, these, young th these four young men at the bottom, they went and sat at a Woolworths counter that was for whites well, only. Right, that was for whites only, and so this spur, this whole bunch of people went and did this. Like lots and lots of people did it across the South, and here you have some people. See, they're sitting at the counter, and these kids are dumping food and drink on them, right? But they're just sitting there peacefully, right? They're being peaceful about this. And then, then another famous thing is the Selma to Montgomery marches in 1965. So there were three protest marches. And again, we have Martin Luther King Jr. right here at the front on the right-hand side. And he led these marches, which was 55-mile march from Selma to Montgomery, which was the capital of Alabama. And this was because of voter suppression, right? They were, blacks were made to do all these different kinds of tests because they didn't want blacks to vote. And honestly, that's still happening today. Um, so this, so this then, this then contributed to the passage of the Voting Rights Act, which was a landmark thing in the federal, in the civil rights movement. And so then, one last thing, which is very current today, is the Black Lives Matter. So right, you know, in 2013, we had Trayvon Martin, who was killed basically for walking with a sweatshirt, and being black through a neighborhood. And then you have, um, you know, you had George Floyd, right, recently, Ahmaud Aubrey, Aubrey, and Breonna Taylor. So these are protests that are still ongoing, right? Because we want to stop systemic racism and the killing of blacks just because, of course, they're black, which is appalling. So that's, that's my presentation for today. But I want to have um, Susie talk and then um, Donna talk about, let me put, I'm put Susie on first here, to talk about their experiences with um, civil disobedience and what it was like to be part of activities in the 60s and before that. Spotlight. There's Susan. Hi everyone. I just want to share that where I'm from, originally from, which is Charleston, South Carolina, and, and so South Carolina is a southern state, in the city of Charleston. We're right on the Atlantic Ocean by the water, and it's a city that was one of the main places for importing slaves. And if you ever get to go visit Charleston, they actually have a museum called the Old Slave Mart. And it's where they used to bring the slaves to auction them off to be sold to, uh, to the white owners. And my question was, when I went to visit it, was where did the slaves come from? And I found out that where did they keep the slaves? Because it's just a little balcony out front, is they have an underground tunnel that they would keep the slaves. And Charleston is a very old city. It has a lot of history. And when I grew up, like Jennifer said, it was segregated. And what does that mean? That blacks and whites did not live together. In, my, in Charleston, blacks lived on one side of the town and whites lived on the other. And the only time that you really got together is basically if on the main street. One of the main streets is called King Street and Meeting Street. And on King Street would be our main shopping area. And at that time when I grew up, there were no uh, black salesmen, salesperson, uh, man or woman that would work at the stores that would sell clothing to you, furniture, those sorts of things. And when they finally got one, a person in the 60s, she worked at one of the stores and she worked as a shoe salesman. She worked in the shoe department. And that person uh, is actually became my mom's neighbor. She's 94 years old. She's still alive. And when I go back home to visit, I always visit her because she's my mom's neighbor. Uh, one of the things I experienced growing up also was segregation on the bus like Rosa Parks. Uh, the lunch lunch counters, we could not get, we could buy our hamburger and our hot dogs, but we could not sit at the counter. We had to go out the door and to eat it. Uh, as I said, we didn't live in the same communities. In the black communities, we were supported by our church and our schools. Uh, that was what our support was. And <clears throat> voting, my mom said when she grew up, and well, she was an adult by then, when she went to vote, they gave you a little short paragraph that you had to read. And 
if you did not stop at the punctuations, then you would fail and you could not vote. They would not allow you to vote. Now, Charleston has changed over the years, but I actually lived where it was segregated and they said they had signs in the five and dime stores that we would go to that said colored and, and white. And they would have the, at the five and dime, they would have the water fountains and they would have two. They would have one for white, one for colored. And the one for the colored was always warm. It was never cold. So of course, me and my friends, we would drink from the white ones because it was always a cool, the water was cool. And the ladies would say, get away from that, get away from that. What are you doing drinking from that? So I've experienced the segregation in growing up. One of the things that I got to experience growing up also was uh, not in, in South Carolina, but in Ohio, I went to college. After Martin Luther King died, the students started rioting. And as a result, they sent soldiers out with bayonets, with long rifles and everything. And once things quieted down, we did march saying this was our last peaceful march as college students because everyone was so upset about uh, the death of Martin Luther King. I want to go back to Charleston just to share with you uh, how Charleston has come a long way. And I'm going to show you, if you ever get to go to Charleston, you have, this is a new, can you, this is the new bridge that they have built. It's beautiful. It's one of the, it's now like a historic site. If you ever go to Charleston, you'll get to see ladies making baskets, what is called made out of sweet grass. And this is an African trait that's been passed down from families. And these baskets can be very expensive. I'm going to show you one that I have. Let me show you. Okay. Okay. I've actually got a book on sweet, how to make uh, this, the history of sweet grass baskets. Let me show you one. Look at this one. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it looks almost like a snowman, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. But it can be taken apart and you can use each one. And this is a, this is something and a trait that, and a skill that our ancestors from Africa do, uh, learned to do. So. Charleston, if you ever get a chance to go, you really want to visit it. They've got churches from the 1700s. They've got, they're surrounded by plantations where slaves actually lived. Uh, it's changed. It's, there, it's really, really changed now, but you have to go and see Charleston because there's so much history and everything. And one of the things I also want to share with you, Charleston has a tea plantation. It's the only state in the United States that actually grows its own tea. Many times we get our tea from where? Anybody know what country that grows tea? I in what? India. India. India, another India. country? England. Ryan said England. China. What about China? China. China. Yes. Right. So you can, do, this is one of the places you can actually go visit is the Charleston Tea Plantation. So that's just a little something. Jennifer, you're going to do something about quotes a little later. I'm sorry. Oh, can I do? Do you? Are you going to do something about the quilting, or can we share that? Yeah, let. Why don't you share it right now? We can talk about that okay. now. Okay. Well, I'm going to share with you two things. This is a quilt that was made by my mom for Ryan, and you can see it's got lots of different things. It's got little flowers that used to be a gown of hers. It's got parrots and chickens and birds on this one. It's got polka dots. It's got stripes. And this, my mom made this for Ryan when he was a little boy. This quilt is about 30 some years old now. My mom made quilts for all of her grandkids. This is the second quilt I want to share with you. This quilt is almost 100 years old. My grandmother made this quilt. So it, and it has, this does not tell the story maybe of slavery, but it tells they would use old clothing that they had and they would make the clothes. And you can see this one has lots and lots of, of flowers. Mm -hmm. So we just wanted to share this with you that as a Southern tradition, 
ladies always were sewing quilts and everything. So just wanted to share with you some of our treasures from uh, black folks learning uh, skills being passed down from one generation to the other. And it started with the slaves teaching, uh, doing the quilts to show how to get uh, to travel from the south to the north. And it continued throughout the years where families just made quilt to stay warm. Mm -hmm. And this, as I said, this one's almost 100 years old. Thank you. Well, so, and when you, when you talk about the quilts, right, everyone received their quilt squares and there were different patterns, right, that we saw and they meant different things. Oh, yes, um, and like there's the, see there, Ryan has the log cabin one, right? So yeah. you can color yeah. it. And so it would mean different things and they would, um, you, you could send messages that way. So, yeah. and the thing I like about quilts, right, is that they are, um, there are you, there's something that people use that's a work of art. So I mean, like, so Greg's grandmother was a quilter and we have some of her quilts and his mother can look at all the pieces in it and say, that was my dress, that was my brother's shirt. Same thing as Susie was talking about, right? There's a family history of the clothes and memories included in, in the quilt. And my, one of my sisters is actually a quilter, um, which is unusual, you don't have that many quilters anymore, people my age, but she's quilting, she quilts all the time. And again, it's just a, it's, it's a, it's an art form that I think is, um, first of all, it's, it's women, female dominated too, which is kind of nice. Um, and it's something that you can use every day. It's a piece of artwork that you have on your bed, which I think is lovely. Okay. So we're going to then have Susie, we're going to have Donna talk. So let me move her to the forefront here. And we get well, Donna. I want to talk about quilts first. Okay. Wait, I have two quilts that I cherish. And when I was growing up, all the churches all had a ladies quilting group. Mm -hmm. And in my church that I went to, they met every, uh, the third Thursday of every month at my grandmother's house. And when I was married, I, they gave me a quilt that is called the wedding ring quilt, which was sort of traditional, mm -hmm. especially in German families, mm -hmm. that the you got a wedding ring quilt. And I also have a quilt that was made, the pieces were all of my old dresses as I was growing up, because you kept everything. Mm -hmm. So I have those two quilts that I really cherish. But also when I was growing up, I grew up in a small town called Sykeston, Missouri which is down, if you know the shape of Missouri, there's a little corner down that sticks out and it's called the Boot Hill. And Sykes of Missouri is down in that Boot Hill. And when I was growing up, there was a neighborhood in the town called the Sunset Edition. And there was a reason they called it the Sunset Edition because all of the people of color that lived in Sykes and had to live in that town or that part of town. And it was called Sunset because when the sun went down, all the black people had to be off the streets and in Sunset Edition. And if they weren't, they would be arrested. And if I, as a white person, was walking down the street, and I met a black person, that black person would have to step off the sidewalk until I went by. It didn't matter if there was plenty of room on the sidewalk or not, but black people had to step off the sidewalk when white people went by. So that's the type of town that I lived in for the first 14 years of my life. And then when I went to a high school that had one black person in it. And when I was a freshman in high school, I, uh, the band that I played in took a trip to New Orleans. And I took a trolley ride. Mm -hmm. And I was, my best friend and I were so proud of ourselves that we took this trolley ride and we were going to church on a Sunday morning. We got on the trolley and there was a sign about three quarters of the way back on the car that said colored. And I said, what is that? And the, there were very few people on the car because it was a Sunday morning. And there were two black people sitting in the back 
and the driver said uh in case you don't know white people sit in the front and black people sit in the back or he said the colored sit in the back so i marched myself down to the back of the, the car and i sat in the colored part and the man who was sitting the black man who was sitting there moved it to the side and put it in back of me and he said ma'am if you sit back with us, you're going to get in trouble, and we're going to get in trouble. Now, it didn't bother me that I was going to get in trouble because I was in trouble a lot in my life. <laughs> when I when I saw rules, I had to either bend or break them. But the fact that he would get in trouble for something I did, I couldn't tolerate that. So I marched myself back up front with my friend, who was sitting up there cowering. And I marched myself back up and I sat in the white section. But I thought, this is wrong and I've got to do something about it. I didn't really do anything about it until it was in the 60s when Dr. King was starting to do marching. And I had to do something about it. And my husband felt that I shouldn't because he feared for my life. But I had to do something. And there was a group called Freedom Riders. And we would take up, I lived at this time in Columbus, Ohio. And we would take buses and we would bus down into the South to march for voting rights or try to register people to vote. And that's what I did mostly. I was arrested two times and uh, I spent a couple of nights in jail, which was very, very frightening. But I also, the first time, there were three nuns, we were crammed in the cell and, I, and there was like 10 people in the cell for four that had four cots in it. And there were three nuns that just sort of took me under their wings and said, it's gonna be all right, you're doing the right thing. And they really calmed me down and made me realize that what I'm going through is absolutely nothing to what the black people down here are going through. So the next time I was in jail, I could help somebody else who was very frightened. But I worked to register people to vote and uh, I marched and at that time we marched a lot and um, I felt that when the voters rights bill was signed and the civil rights bill was signed by President Johnson that we had won and today I worry and I pray and I wonder at my age, what can I do? So that's where I am with civil disobedience. Thank you, Donna. Does anybody have any questions for Donna? Would you be able to do what she did? How would you want to, I mean, being in jail is a scary thing. It's yeah, very brave, it is. very brave thing. So we admire that. All right, that's great. So does anyone have any, so I have a question. So do, does, how do people feel about breaking the law? I mean, at, at what point should we break the law? You know, what, what things do you think are appropriate to break the law for? Have you thought about that? I mean, so, so like for Donna, right, she was willing to break the law because she saw that people needed to vote. That was a very, very important thing for people to be able to vote. And the, um, during the Underground Railroad, all these Quakers and, and other folks saw that people should not own other people. That wasn't, you know, that wasn't God's law, right? That was man's law and God's law trumps that. And so we need to help people get out of slavery to be free because that is not right. Um, are there other things that you see that are like that? 
Um, so I know, like, so in, in India, in the 1930s, Gandhi had called the salt marches, and he, he was sort of the, the model then for MLK. And so he was doing that for the folks, the poor people in India. Um, another, another act of civil disobedience was the Boston Tea Party. Do we remember what that was? Right, that was taxation without representation, which is what is on the DC license plate is that the government in England was taxing people in the United States, they were taxing their tea and they didn't want to pay, pay it. So they dumped the tea overboard into the Boston Harbor. So have, would any of you take it, would any of you participate in something for like Black Lives Matter? Is that something that you would want to do? do you, is that upsetting to you? What happened to like George Floyd? Or even going back to Rodney King, right? He had the same experience, you know, 30 years ago. All right, so let's um, let's I'm end. Going to share. Go ahead, Susie. I was going to share that everyone that's on the uh, presentation today represent persons with disabilities. Yes. And they're always fighting for their civil rights, always, uh, whether it's to get affordable housing or accessible housing or accessible transportation. So that's a form of civil rights for, uh, when you're protesting and you're marching or you're testi testifying for persons with disabilities again you want their civil rights to be met just like folks who do not have a disability absolutely just want to remind folks that what they do every day for themselves is a means of a civil rights for persons with disability absolutely absolutely well i'm going to end with one one thing so i actually have a quilt i'm going to share that was greg's grandmother made which I think you guys will all like to see it's kind of fun you can see these are all different dresses can you see this see all the different fabrics so I thought that's kind of right it's like the quilts that you guys are gonna make it has all these different things it's a very complex quilt but it's beautiful my cat likes to sleep on it so it's a little bit furry so, anyway. but um, so did it does anyone have besides Ryan have their quilt square let me see if I can you, my gallery. Does anyone else have their quilt square with them? We have Ryan. Did, Vanessa, do you have yours? Uh, so, Allison is showing her. Allison, you're showing your thing. So that's what you're going to put it inside of, right? Your hoop. Your hoop. You can put your, your square inside, right? Do you have your fabric in there too somewhere that you get to color? So, so because see, that's what I like about the quilts. They're very individual to you. So you can make them in the color that you want that are meaningful to you. And I'd hoped to have us all get it back together, but I thought that would never happen, so we didn't do that. Uh, but at this way, you can put you can put the f the finished piece in your hoop, and you can have it as your own kind of protest piece, right? This is your own little bit of civil disobedience. There we go. Okay, great. All right, well, it's good to see everybody. Well, our next thing is going to be in November, and we're going to talk about um, th being thankful and giving thanks. So I appreciate everyone being on the call today. Harold, I haven't heard you all day today. You have to say something to me. Harold's quiet today. Nope, nothing from Harold. Okay, well, it's good to see everybody. And we'll all talk soon. Thank you for joining, yeah, Vanessa. It was nice to see you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Yeah, oh, there you are there, Harold. Yay. Bye, Harold. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.